right, good morning, you guys. Uh, so kids, you guys are dismissed. Elementary kids, pre through five, and then our youth group, six through 12, you guys are also dismissed. Pastor Chris has a great word to share with you this morning. I was going to say, doesn't Susie do such a great job on announcements each week? And now I have to cross that out from my notes. <laughs> no, I appreciate you guys, and it uh, you know it's uh, just a privilege to get to do what I do and to uh, hopefully be a source of encouragement uh, to you, just a channel of uh, the true source of encouragement, which of course is the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God. Um, I wanted to mention quickly, um, Susie mentioned uh, each week we're going to have a different faith distinctive of Calvary Mountain View. These aren't things necessarily that um, are completely unique to our church, but some of them, as you'll see as we go on, are just a little unique to how we look at things and how we do ministry, kind of our philosophy of ministry and our perspective about different things within ministry. Um, and so each week we're going to um, sort of uh, introduce a new one of those. They'll be in the e-bulletin on Wednesday and then as well kind of a hard copy on Sunday. Uh, in the e-bulletin, there's a link through to the church website where you can have access to these whenever you want them, download them if you want. Um, if you were to save them, they'd actually become a good little sort of a resource um, uh, just about these different things. And we're starting out this week with the one on becoming a Christian because after all, that's the starting point for any and all of this, and it's certainly important every day, but I think particularly important after finishing up the text we finished up last week, just looking at the great white throne judgment. So anyway, that's a note about that, but you can look forward to those in the coming weeks. Um, also in the coming weeks, you can look forward. Uh, did you know that next week we will finish the book of Revelation? And uh, then, we're going to go on to something fantastic, which I will tell you at the end of service next time. So you can look forward to that. Uh, this has been a great study. Um, but I'm also looking forward to some things I think the Lord has for us uh, through some of the other biblical authors. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 21 this morning. Ooh. And um, <laughs> it's not as sort of like a voice coming from heaven told us that. But uh, chapter 21, so you can turn there, and while you do, uh, let's go ahead and pray and just ask the Lord to bless uh, his word this morning. So, Father, we do thank you, Lord, just for the, uh, the privilege that we have to be able to assemble here together, Lord, freely, and to worship you, Lord, and to uh, be ministered to by you through your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we set this time aside, Lord, that it would be a time where you would meet with us here this morning, Lord. We come expectantly, Lord, just uh, looking for what it is you have to share with us, uh, each one of us, Lord, individually and collectively, Lord. And we pray it every week, Lord, and every week it's true. We pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation chapter 21. Um, and as we say often, if you don't have a Bible, you're going to want to have a Bible. So uh, if you don't have one on your phone, um, the ones in the pews won't probably help you unless you read uh, Mandarin, I think it is. So uh, if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and one of the guys will get one and bring one to you. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. And as I said, we are in the home stretch of our study through this incredible book. And we now have all of that time of the tribulation behind us. And you'll remember a couple of weeks back, we rejoiced in chapter 19 uh, at the second coming of Jesus to the earth. And then last week in chapter 20, we looked at some of the great things that are in store for the earth right after that event. Um, and the first of them was that our great enemy, Satan, is defeated and will be imprisoned, at least temporarily, bound in chains, cast into the bottomless pit. Uh, we saw immediately after that that there is a great coming kingdom, right? We talked a lot last week about the glorious description of that thousand-year millennial kingdom, which we said is going to be a literal kingdom here on the literal earth when Jesus will 
literally reign in complete righteousness for a thousand years, literally. Right? After which, there's going to be this one great final rebellion. We saw that Satan will actually be released from the bottomless pit because he has one more function to, uh, to serve for the Lord. As he assembles this army of the nations, they try to unite to overcome Christ only to find themselves overcome, we read, by fire that comes down from heaven. And that leads us to that last final great event in the history of the world. It was the great white throne judgment. And if you remember from our text last week, it will only be the lost from all of the ages that are going to stand there at the great white throne before Jesus to be ultimately sentenced for their rejection of him, cast into the lake of fire, and to be separated from God for all of eternity. And it was a pretty heavy end to our chapter, and it's really a pretty heavy end to all of human history. And yet this morning then, as we turn the page, we're really going to enjoy an entirely new and a very refreshing perspective as we're going to see God, you know, after all of these great things that are to come, we're going to see this morning that he really will make all things new. And I loved the way that one author described it. He wrote that from the smoke and pain and heat, it is a relief to pass into the clear, clean atmosphere of the eternal morning where the breath of heaven is sweet and the vast newness of God sparkles like a diamond in the radiance of his presence. So here, understand that with the end of that thousand-year millennial kingdom, we've now passed beyond the realm of time and straight into the timelessness of eternity. And our text begins today with this beautiful description of where it is that we, each one of us as believers in Jesus, where it is that we're going to spend our eternity. And that's the new heaven and the new earth. Look at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 21. It says, John writes, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. So here John now sees our new heavenly home. It's this new heaven, it's this new earth that God is going to create for us, the saints. We know that, you know, this world that we live in now, this is not our home, right? Peter says that we're just sojourners, we're pilgrims here because we are headed to eternity. We are headed to this new heaven and this new earth that God is going to create for us after all of this stuff is done. We know that the first heaven, right, this heaven, this earth, was prepared for Adam and Eve and all of their descendants that would come. God had perfectly prepared everything for them. He placed them there in that perfect garden. And unfortunately, we know the story, right, they sinned and they ushered death and decay into all of God's beautiful creation. Romans chapter 8 tells us that this whole creation, right, this world that we live in right now, Paul says that the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and it labors with birth pangs. So we also know that God promised through the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 65, he said, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. So the old creation, where we are now, has to make way for the new creation. And what Peter tells us is that this present heaven and earth is going to be completely destroyed one day. He says that the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So things are going to be just completely dissolved. 
right? It will go up in this gigantic explosion with a big bang. So really, man has it completely backwards, don't we? Right? We didn't begin with a big bang, but we will absolutely end with a big bang. And this whole thing, everything we see is going to melt with this fervent heat and be completely replaced with something completely new. And understand, not refurbished, but replaced. Now, a thousand years before this, remember we said prior to that millennial reign, God will refurbish, he will kind of refresh the world in preparation for the millennial kingdom. And it occurred to me this week, isn't it interesting, do you remember 20 years ago, right, in 2000, the, the big revision that year to the Windows operating system, it was called Windows ME, right, or Windows Millennial Edition. And the one groundbreaking feature of Windows ME was this new thing called System Restore. Do you remember that? It first came out, right? Where you could, after you had some kind of a crash or if you had conflicting drivers, you know, that kind of had stopped up your machine, you could magically just go back and select an earlier date, a system restore date, and then all the things that you had messed up would then be put back and restored and refreshed to that same workable state before the problem took hold of things. And coincidentally, that's exactly what's going to happen before the millennium. But now after the millennium, God's going to make something entirely new, something that will not ever again be corrupted. It'll probably be more like a Mac operating system instead of... Okay, actually it's going to be way better even than that. The ancient word in the Greek that's translated new means new in character. It, it doesn't mean recent or it doesn't mean new in time. This, this isn't going to just be the next heaven or the next earth. It's going to be a better heaven and a better earth. Better because it will be completely untouched by the effects of sin and it'll be unaffected by the fall. That word create there in that Isaiah passage, it's the Hebrew word bara. And it's the very same Hebrew word that's used back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible, that says, in the beginning God created, or he borrowed the heaven and the earth. And bara in Hebrew doesn't simply mean to create, it means to create something out of nothing. So God didn't just put this planet together from a bunch of raw materials he found floating around in space, right? He spoke when there was nothing, and all of a sudden there was something, and only God can do that. And so God uses that very same Hebrew word bara when he talks about the creating of the new heaven and the new earth. He's not just going to reform it, that's asa. Right? He's not just going to reform, reform what was here, but it's this total new creation out of nothing. Peter said that we look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. For John says here that the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So that's what's in our future. And all of that was sort of to say this. That doesn't mean that we don't have to have a concern for the earth even now. We, that we shouldn't be concerned at all for the world and the forests and the oceans and, and all of this and all of that. But what it does mean is that we as Christians don't need to be alarmed when we see some failing aspect of our current environment because we're worried that somehow the world has to last forever because it doesn't need to last forever. This whole world is winding down and it's winding down by design because God is going to bring it all to an end and is going to create something completely new out of nothing. And it's interesting here, the Bible is pretty silent on all the features of this new creation. Nowhere are there any descriptions that talk about 
the characteristics or the vegetation or the color or the form. I think the implication is probably that this new earth will be round like the current earth is. The only detail, notice, that John gives us here is what? That there is no more sea. Now, this may have been specifically mentioned because the ancient people, to them, the sea was something that they feared. It wasn't a place where they vacationed, right, like it is for us. They feared it because it was a place of danger and a place of darkness, a place of mystery. It was kind of a symbol of everything that was ominous and sinister and threatening. So to see that there would be no more sea would have brought a sense of peace to them. Some have also suggested that the reason that there will be no more sea is because apparently a part of the purpose on the planet today of the sea and of all of the salt in the sea is that all of that salt collects and neutralizes all the pollutants of the earth so the earth stays inhabitable by mankind. So where there will be no pollutants in the new earth, there will be no more necessity for the sea. So if you happen to love the ocean, and if you perhaps happen to love surfing, you just have to trust that God is going to have something that's much, much better for you, which I think as we go through our text today, you're going to see that he does. So the next thing that John sees, he's going to have his attention now in verse 2, directed to a very specific feature of this new heaven and new earth. He says in verse 2 that then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So understand this, right? descending down from heaven, almost like a sort of a satellite, if you will, John sees this beautiful, new, heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. So beautiful was what John saw, in fact, that he used the most striking and the most beautiful image that he could possibly think of, right? The most beautiful thing that a man will ever see is what? It's his bride coming down the aisle to meet him. And John said that this is how beautiful the new Jerusalem is going to be. Both beautiful and pure. Because in the Jewish culture, a bride was nothing less than the picture of purity. So all of the things that a bride is on her wedding day... Understand that this city will be, it'll be refreshing and beautiful and exciting. And all of that will simply radiate from her, right, from this city. In John chapter 14, do you remember as Jesus was preparing the disciples for his departure, he said, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And so many Bible students see the promise of Jesus here as referring to this city, which will be our eternal dwelling place. Now, some believe that it's going to come down from heaven and it's going to rest eternally on the new earth. Others believe that it's going to come down and somehow kind of hover just above the earth. And I'm going to let you choose whichever one of those you like the best, and we will all find out when we get there. Amen? But what's most important isn't the location of this city. Again, it's the character of it. Because notice again, John refers to it as a holy city. And what he's doing here when he does that is he's contrasting the new Jerusalem with the old Jerusalem. Now, the current city of Jerusalem is beautiful, and it is a significant city, of course, but it's also a fallen city. And we remember back in chapter 8, God actually calls the city of Jerusalem Sodom, doesn't he? Because of what we know that it's going to become, spiritually speaking, during the Great Tribulation. It's going to become the center of the worship of the Antichrist. We also, of course, know that long before that, as much as we may love the city of Jerusalem, as much as we are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem... Jerusalem was the site of the single greatest crime in all of the history of the world. 
It was the site of the murder of the Messiah, Jesus. It was the site, it was the place where the creation crucified the creator. But now here we see that the creator is now going to recreate Jerusalem, redeeming it forever, truly as the city of peace. And it's the place where he will be with his people now for all of eternity. And in verses 3 through 8, John tells us a little bit about this new relationship that we're going to have with the Lord. It says in verse 3, John says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So the most important thing about this city is the fact that God will dwell there with his people in just the very same way that a husband dwells with his bride. And of course, this just gives us these images of this intimacy of this relationship that we will someday finally have with the Lord and that we will enjoy for all of eternity. Paul says to the Corinthians that now, he says, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Imagine it, no more praying prayers to him by faith, no more trying to follow after him in faith. We will be in a relationship with him face to face, right? Always conscience, conscious pardon me, of his presence with us. And I love, Jesus said this in John 17, 17. He said that this is eternal life. He says that they may know you, the only true God. That's what eternal life is, knowing God. And I think it's been well said, it's been said that the tragedy of life isn't that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. This is the reason that we were created. We were created to dwell with God and to be in relationship with him. And the whole Bible is the story of God's efforts to dwell with us, right? We think about the way that God walked, it says, with Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. Then we know that he dwelt with Israel, both first in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. And when Israel sinned, God had to depart from those dwellings. Later, he came to earth, John tells us, as Jesus, and he dwelt, or literally the word is that he tabernacled among us. Today, we know that God doesn't live in man-made temples or in tabernacles, but he lives where? He lives in the bodies of his people. He lives in the church. And yet, even though God lives inside of us as believers today by his spirit, we have not fully begun to understand God or to really fully fellowship with him the way that we want or the way that he wants. But John tells us that one day we will dwell in the presence of God fully and enjoy him forever. There will be this new intimacy with him which can only be possible in a world where sin and death and corruption are no longer there. Right, this eternal city is so wonderful because God is there dwelling with his people in a very new, a very complete, a very total way. And it will be like nothing that we could ever imagine. In fact, you notice that the best way that John could find to try to describe what this was going to be like, this new sort of profound intimacy that we're going to have with God, notice that he does it by telling us what would no longer be part of our experience. He says there won't be any more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. All of these things which were introduced into the human condition because of our rebellion. You know, God never intended these things to be a part of human history. And one day, 
they are all going to simply go by the wayside. Imagine it, right? No more funerals, no more heartbreak, no more loss, and no more trying to process all of those kinds of things with a body and a mind and a heart that were never truly created to be able to process death, right? Death was never intended to be part. We were never supposed to even encounter death. And at this point, then, there will be no more pain, no more tears. It says God is going to wipe all of that away from our eyes. Have you ever actually had someone wipe a tear from your eye? Or maybe you've wiped a tear away from someone else's eye, a child or someone that you love. It is one of the most tender things that can happen in the human experience to have a tear wiped away from your eye by another person. And this says that Jesus is going to do that for each one of us related to our lives in our future. There will be no regret at all as we go into eternity. There will be no remembering what we were. There will be no remembering what we weren't. There will be no recollection of who is saved or who wasn't saved or any of that. Right? The whole history of all of that is just going to go because he's going to wipe all of those tears away. No more, no more, no more. None of these things because a part of what makes heaven heaven is what will no longer be part of our human experience because of sin. And this is why in every age it's the hope of heaven and it's the relief that we know will come from all of these things, that is what has been such an encouragement to God's people in times of suffering. And we can only imagine how this kind of thought must be and bring peace to our dear Christian brothers and sisters there in Afghanistan, even at this moment. Knowing that all the things that they are going through and all of their suffering and their fear and their anxiety and their uncertainty and their pain and their sorrow, that all of it will eventually come to an end, even if it comes to an end through death. But they can be sure, just as we can be sure, that it is coming. Because listen to what John hears next. It says in verse 5, John says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. So for the first time now in this eternal scene, God himself speaks, right? He is the God who is able to make all things new, and we can count on that. It's like he's saying to John, everything that you're seeing, all these things that you're hearing, it is done. It is as good as done. It is in the future of my people because I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And when God speaks and makes this kind of a promise, it is a done deal. Because he always keeps his promises and he has given us the entire rest of the Bible, right? The record of his work among men, he's given us that to assure us of this reality. And of course, when he says, it is done here, it parallels, right, in John chapter 19, when Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished, right? So after the gloom and the darkness and the pain and the sorrow and the anguish of Jesus being separated from the Father because of our sin, he cries out, it is finished. Because at that point, now, the basis of our redemption was complete and the sacrifice was ended and the foundation was fully laid. And here we see that this very same Lord who started creation and then redeemed the creation himself will also finish it. And here he says, it is done. 
Here, the redemption is complete. Now, all of the redeemed are safely home in glory. And everything that God wanted to do now is done. Right? Genesis opens with this, the account of the creation of the first heaven and earth. And here, Revelation closes with this beautiful account of his creation of a new heaven and a new earth. And notice what God says at the end of that. Not only is he the creator of all physical life itself, but he's also the giver of everlasting life to anyone who will receive it. Verse 6, he says, I'll give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Remember in John chapter 4, Jesus had that beautiful encounter with the woman at the well. And he told her this. He said, whoever drinks of this water, so the water of that well, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And as believers in Jesus, we will share in this new creation because we've received that water of life from the author of life. That water of life that it says here is available to anyone and everyone who thirsts. And this is amazing to me because here we are literally in the final pages of the revelation, right? Here, you know, declaring that the, God is declaring that this new heaven and this new earth and this wonderful salvation is freely available to everyone who wants it. He is still throwing out the nets, isn't he? Because for all throughout history, for the past 2,000 plus years, people have read this very book and wondered to themselves, wow, this is the future how can I have a place in it? And he gives them this promise here as he describes it. He says, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So this glorious city that's going to be the home of the redeemed and the only qualification for it is that you be thirsty. So if you are here this morning and you be thirsty, if you are spiritually thirsty here this morning, Jesus will satisfy that thirst. And let me tell you, there is nothing here on this earth or of this earth that will satisfy it. Right? Wealth, fame, pleasures, treasures, none of those things will meet that deep thirst of your soul. And that is exactly why we can see the rich and the wealthy, and all of the beautiful people, right? They're all out there looking for something more, and most often they are destroying themselves trying to find it. And still we see that they're not satisfied. But here's this beautiful promise that God will satisfy that thirst, right? For anyone who wants to know, right, who they want to know more, who want God, they're promised that they will be able to drink of this water of the fountain of life and that they can drink as much as they can possibly handle. Freely, it says. And then through believing in him, now John goes on to say that you have an eternity now that's secure in him. Listen to what God promises John next. In verse 7, it says that he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So how do you overcome, right? How do you inherit all things? Simply by trusting in Jesus Christ, right? This new heaven, this new earth, this new Jerusalem, this new future, the no more tears, and the no more sorrow, and the no more pain, all of these things all of these things are going to be ours simply because we are now his children. In, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said this. He said, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Right? God's going to say, here you go. Right? This is all yours. Go ahead and just enjoy it. 
And this could seem too good to be true. That's once again why God has to specifically tell John that these words are faithful and true. Right? All of this is going to be ours simply because of our faith in him, no matter of how much loss we might suffer during this lifetime. There's a wonderful story that after the great Chicago fire of 1871, evangelist Dwight Moody went back to survey the ruins of his home. And a friend came by and said to Moody, well, I'm so sorry, I hear that you lost everything. And Moody said, well, you heard wrong. He said, I have a great deal more left than I ever lost. And the friend said, well, well, what do you mean? He said, I didn't know that you were rich. And Moody opened his Bible, turned to this verse, and read out of Revelation 21, 7, that he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he will be my son because our true inheritance isn't at all in things, is it? The way that we're inclined to think. But our true inheritance is in our fellowship and it's through our relationship with God. Peter, right, talks about that inheritance that's incorruptible and that's undefiled, does not fade away. Peter says it's reserved in heaven for you. Understand, that everything that we can see today, all of the wealth of this world is corrupted and it's defiled and it's perishing. And our real riches, right, our true inheritance is to simply enjoy God eternally. Adopted by him, right, as sons and daughters because we've overcome through our faith in Jesus. But it says in verse 8, that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So quite in contrast to the overcomers, you know, we who will inherit all the blessings of fellowship with God, here John's reminded of these people who were themselves overcome by their sin, right? The unbelieving who wouldn't trust in the Lord, their destiny is clear. It's the lake of fire. These are those who we looked at last week, right? Standing there before the great white throne, guilty of that one single sin which condemns people to hell, and that's the rejection of Jesus. Again, I want to be very, very clear. It's very, very important for us to understand that it is not these specific sins that are listed here in this verse that land a person in hell. It's that lifelong rejection of Jesus Christ as my personal savior and as my Lord when these sins then start to characterize a person's life. Because there's just been this willful, deliberate decision that this is how they want to live and so they reject God in order to live this kind of life and to go after those kinds of things. And what that does, of course, is it then reveals that this kind of person has never committed themselves to Christ and so they will now forfeit all these eternal blessings that come through Christ. Now you'll be glad to know we don't need to go through this entire list of sins because they're pretty self-explanatory, I think. But I do want you to notice this. Notice that they start with the cowardly, they move to the unbelieving, they then develop into the abominable, and then they simply continue right on from there. And so the sense here is that it's those who are afraid to take a stand for Jesus when things get difficult. Right? They're cowardly. They're afraid of scorn or of censure by the world because they're not firmly rooted in faith. And instead, they choose ease and they choose comfort. They choose self. They choose self-preservation over choosing Jesus. And that simply reveals their unbelieving hearts. And from that point, it's just a steady slide into an abominable life, which literally just means a polluted life of sin, and it's only inevitable. 
And so they'll have no part in the new Jerusalem because those sins will have no part in the new Jerusalem. So now John's going to continue. He's going to give us a closer look at this heavenly city. In verses 9 through 27, we get a description of the new Jerusalem. Verse 9, John says that then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal." So John's overall impression of this eternal city was like a a gigantic, brilliant, glistening jewel. He compares it to jasper, but then he says it's clear as crystal. So now many believe, of course, the jasper stone that we know today is kind of opaque, right? It's not really very clear. And so the thought here is that maybe what he's describing is something more like what we would know as a diamond. Now a diamond stone wasn't actually even considered a precious stone until the Middle Ages. But the sense certainly of what John sees, he seems to be describing some kind of a crystal clear, right, a radiating and a reflecting light that is coming from this new Jerusalem. The very same way that light refracts through a beautifully cut diamond. And yet, here's what I want us to see right now. For all of the beauty which he's going to talk about, that's not what makes this city beautiful to Jesus. Because what makes this city beautiful to Jesus is that you're there and that I'm there. What makes the city beautiful to Jesus is that his bride is there, right? His wife. And again, I think it's nothing less than amazing the grace that he has and the love that he has for each one of us. It's like it says in Hebrews 12 that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And that joy that was set before him was the promise of us together with him in this city for all of eternity. Right? Jesus could look past the horror of the cross And he could really enjoy the promise of the joy that would come beyond it. And so this city that John's about to describe to us, it has the glory of God, right? It's radiating the light of God. And it is the description of the city that the Holy Spirit is working currently in each one of our lives to prepare us for. In verse 12, it says that also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we're going to see that all of these details that John uses to describe the city, they all just follow the pattern of an ancient city, right? Foundations, walls, gates. But each one of these things speak differently of the different blessings that belong to us as believers, right? Foundations speak now of the permanence of our home in heaven in contrast to these tents, right, that we're using now as pilgrims and as strangers. The walls speak of protection because never again will we have any reason to fear any enemies of any kind whatsoever. They will no longer be a part of our future reality. When you think about that beautiful high wall, it talks about a sense of separation, right, and of intimacy. If you're going to have a garden party, you want walls around your garden, right, to keep unwelcome guests out and to make it a more intimate environment for those who are invited. The gates speak of 
permission, right, and provision. Because notice there's easy access from every side into this heavenly reality. It's a beautiful picture of the fact that we've been granted entry based on the grace of God and the shed blood of Jesus. Right? All of his people now in this city living together both from the old and the new covenants. Notice the 12 gates specifically are identified with the 12 tribes of Israel because it was through the gate of the Jewish people that we as Gentiles have now come to know God. And so here's this perpetual reminder, as Jesus said in John chapter 4, that salvation is of the Jews. It's this perpetual reminder of the very special place that his people have in his redemptive program. Now these 12 foundations associated with the 12 apostles, because their ministry is what became the foundation of God's new dealings with mankind. They talk about what's underneath and what gave it its stability and provided this sense of permanence for this next season of God's work in the world. And I think that both of these are beautiful reminders because how often is it we read through the Old Testament history or we read or study as we just have done through the book of Acts and we see the way that the apostles in the New Testament, we see the way that God's people in the Old Testament, the way that they were despised by the world and the way that they were persecuted and rejected and all of these things that they dealt with but God took note of their sacrifices, right? God doesn't forget any person's personal sacrifice for him, and now they're going to be honored in this way for all of eternity. You think about the book of Hebrews. It talks about all of these men of the faith of the Old Testament. It talks about Abraham and Enoch and Noah and others, you know, parts of these 12 tribes. It says in Hebrews 11 that they were those who died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, that they embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They were looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Understand that Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Isaiah, they were actually looking ahead in faith to this very city that the angel is now showing here to John. They were looking ahead to God's promises, although they were strangers and pilgrims where they lived. Can I just say that living by faith is far easier when we remember that this world is not really our home at all. It's easier when we remember that on this side of eternity, not everything is settled, right? Not every question is going to be answered. Not every wrong is going to be righted. And I think the problem is that too many Christians today really live lives day to day sort of like practical atheists, right? They might have a theoretical belief in God, but that belief doesn't really affect what they do in their day to day. Because when we as believers remember that there is a spiritual reality, that we do have this heavenly home and that that is our real home, then it makes walking in faith, it makes enduring by faith much easier here where we are now. Right? Don't forget, we too are strangers and we are pilgrims on this earth. We are just passing through. We're not going to be here forever. And that we too are just looking for this very same city that has foundations and whose maker and builder is God. Verse 15 said that he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 154 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Now, some of you engineers are going to geek out with me a little here because this is an awesome section, right? 
Back in, in chapter 11, remember that John had measured the earthly Jerusalem. Now here he's invited to measure this heavenly city. And both the dimensions, the details of the description here are just staggering. Right? First he says it's laid out as a square. So it's equal on all sides, which may mean that the city is a perfect cube, or some have suggested maybe that it's a pyramid. I believe, personally, it's a cube because that perfectly fits God's pattern of perfection. In the tabernacle and in the temple, remember that both the altar of burnt offering and the altar of incense, even the, the high priest's bless plate, breastplate, pardon me, were all in the form of a cube. But most significantly, the Holy of Holies itself its dimensions were a perfect cube. And remember, it was the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the, the, pardon me, the, the Holy of Holies that housed the Ark of the Covenant, which of course housed the very presence of God in the midst of his people. And so what we see here is that the whole of the holy city, the New Jerusalem, is the Holy of Holies. Right? It's the dwelling place of Almighty God for all of eternity where God will be in his fullness. And the size of this city itself is staggering. If we take a cubit as 18 inches, then these city walls are 216 feet high. If a furlong is 600 feet, which it was in the ancient days, then this city would be about 1,500 miles long in every direction. That is two-thirds the size of the United States in the length, the width, and the height. So that's the distance from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. It's the distance from Colorado to the East Coast. It's the distance from Mountain View almost to the Mississippi River. And again, that's not just the foundation, but it then goes 1,500 miles up in terms of the height of the city. So if we do the math, there are over 3 billion cubic miles in this city, which makes the New Jerusalem approximately the size of the moon. And so just to run some quick numbers, that means that 40 billion people could each have 35 square acres each to ourselves. Which is simply to say this, there will be plenty of room in heaven for everybody, not just the first 144,000 that get there. Right? This is not going to be like some youth camp where we're all going to be crammed into dorms with like 75 people per room sharing beds, right? It's, and it's not just the size that's staggering. Listen to the the beauty of the building materials that are used. John says that the construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third um, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Walls, foundations, streets, gates, all of it is going to be made of the most precious, clear, and colorful stones that we can even imagine. And we can only try to imagine what this is all gonna look like as God's light and his glory just radiates constantly reflecting all through it. Think about this, Jasper we talked about was probably a clear crystal, Sapphire is a beautiful blue stone, Chalcedony is probably kind of a greenish blue, Emerald is green, Sardonyx like our onyx is like a white stone that has these beautiful brown streaks in it, Sardius is a red stone, Chrysolite is like a yellow quartz, Beryl is green, Topaz yellow green, um, Chrysop 
press is, whatever. Some think it's like a kind of a golden tinted stone. Others think it's sort of an apple green color. Jacinth, jacinth, probably blue, though some think maybe yellow. Amethyst is a very rich purple, maybe kind of a blue red. But whatever these exact colors are going to be, or however you actually pronounce all of those precious stones. I have a good friend who's a jeweler. He's probably dying if he's watching this morning. But the point is that our God is a God of beauty. And all of his beauty is going to be reflected for all of eternity throughout this city that he is preparing for us, his people. I mean, it is just one stunning layer of radiant beauty and natural color laid upon another and another and another. And what I think is interesting is when Peter, when he writes in chapter 4, he writes about the manifold grace of God. And that's an intriguing statement. It's almost as though Peter may have had this holy city in his mind by the Spirit. Because that word that's translated manifold literally means many colored or multifaceted. And one author made this comment. He said that manifold grace is many colored grace, as when a ray of light breaks into a spray of many hues. So each of us receives God's grace at a different angle and flashes it back broken up into some fresh color. Now incidentally, speaking of Peter, if you ever wonder where we got the image of the pearly gates, here it is, right, in verse 21. But what we see is that it's not one pair of huge gates, it's 12 gates. We also see that St. Peter is nowhere at all to be seen at any one of them. Now there are some beautiful cities in this world with some beautiful buildings, right, that are built with some beautiful materials. You think of all the beautiful white stone and the exquisite marble that's used in construction, right? but none of them can even begin to compare to this. You've heard it said before, right? In the New Jerusalem, diamonds are like concrete. Gold is like asphalt. And down here, we spend all of our lives and all of our energy and all of our soul trying to attain these things that in heaven are just common building materials that you could pick up at Home Depot. And what Jesus is trying to tell us in all of this is what the real riches are in life. He says, hey, up here, we build stuff out of the stuff that you are spending your whole life and all of your energy trying to get. Right? Our true riches are not these things. It's our relationship with him that's the treasure. But what we see next is that as beautiful as this new city is going to be, there will be some things that are going to be seemingly missing. Verse 22 says, John says, I, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Now, to say to the first century world that there would be no, a city with no temple in it would be like saying to us that there would be a city with no bank in it. Right? But there won't need to be a temple because, as we've seen, the whole city is going to be indwelt by the presence of God. And we've talked about before, remember, all through the Old Testament, first the tabernacle and then the temple that followed, all of it was filled right, with these types and these shadows in the way that they were designed and in the different furnishings. And all of those things pointed symbolically ahead to Jesus. But now here in eternity, right, no more shadows, no more types, no more pointing because the fullness of all of those things, that's going to be our portion for all of eternity. The sun, the moon are going to be absent Right? Because that glorious Shekinah glory of God is going to flood the city. And Isaiah tells us there's going to be no more night ever. He says that the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor uh, for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. 
Right? His glory is going to replace the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars. Verse 24 says that the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now, very quickly, these verses can be a little bit tricky because the sense here isn't that the earth, again, is going to be populated with different nations the way we know today. There will only be redeemed, glorified believers in the eternal state. But the sense of these verses reflects what was a very common ancient practice that the kings of the surrounding nations would bring offerings of their wealth and they would bring their glory into the city of the greatest king in order to honor him with the very best that they had. So all of the best of the riches and the power and the prestige and the wealth and the honor, everything that they had here on earth, it's an acknowledgement that all of it belongs rightfully in that heavenly city to our heavenly king. For all of eternity, in the eternal city, everyone will honor Jesus, the king of kings. Verse 27, but there shall by no means, uh, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Right? We talked about the Lamb's Book of Life last week, right? So this, this new Jerusalem, this new heavens, this new earth, it will be pure, it will be holy, it will never again be tainted by sin. Can you even imagine? Right. I want us to close this morning just with a quick interesting story that I had read years and years ago, and yet it's so fitting here. It's about a young pastor from Africa who had come to America to study. And his very first sermon in his elementary preaching class, Lawrence, who was the name of this African student, he chose a text that described these joys that we are going to share when Christ returns and then when he ushers us into our heavenly home. And he preached his sermon and then when he finished he shared this with his classmates. He said, I've been in the United States for several months now, and I've seen the great wealth that is here, all of the beautiful homes and the cars and the clothes. He says, I've listened to many sermons in churches here too. He says, but I've yet to hear one single sermon about heaven. He says, because everyone has so much in this country, no one preaches about heaven because people here don't seem to need it. He says, in my country, most people have nothing, or they have very little, if anything, so we preach on heaven all the time. He said, because we know how much we need to hear about it and how much we need to be reminded of it. And so my encouragement for us this morning is that we, too, need to hear about it and we too need to be reminded of it but not because we have nothing but precisely because we have so much because we have everything by the world standards we are so rich in this country we have no idea and because of that we have this tendency to so easily have our focus so easily pulled from the eternal and put on the temporal, right? From that heavenly perspective to an earthly one as the cares and the concerns, all of those things that come with maintaining all of these things that we have. And so we do need to be reminded this isn't our home, right? We are just passing through for a very little while and we are on the way to an eternal reality and it's an eternal reality that Jesus is preparing for us even now but that in a very real way we can start living in even here because that very same thing that he's going to do in making all things new in heaven he's starting to do it even now in our hearts isn't he 
as he's preparing us for heaven. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the the great encouragement that it gives us, Lord. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to live, Lord, with an eternal, Lord, with a heavenly perspective. Father, we pray that to whatever degree that we each individually have have shifted from that, Lord, we pray that you would make that reality um, new and fresh to us this morning. Lord, I, I pray for those who have dear loved ones, Lord, who've gone ahead of them, Lord. We know how precious heaven is to them, Lord. And we pray that you'd give us each that sense of, um, of expectancy, Lord, and that sense of excitement, Lord, about what you have in store for every one of us. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.